Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. I am Alan and today we're going to be taking some pictures in our macro lighting cage. After giving it a lot of thought, I have decided that I'm going to do this in two videos. The reason is a lot of the principles are different for flash lighting and continuous lighting. The skills you need are different, the way you're going to set up your camera and, and the, the lights is different. So rather than uh, make a, a super long video that could end up confusing people, I'm going to split it into two and we're going to address continuous lighting today. Before we do, there are a couple of general principles that I want to, uh, to bring up. The first I wouldn't have thought to bring up if it hadn't been for a, a very thoughtful comment uh, from Patrick. Thank you, Patrick, uh, who had seen the, the video on macro lighting. And he raised the question of, uh, am I not concerned about the low CRI of these inexpensive LEDs that we're using? And the answer to the question was, yes, I am concerned, but just not very much. And let me explain why. CRI is the color rendering index of a light source. It basically tells you how accurately colors will be rendered under that light. Now, the, the range of CRIs in LEDs goes from about 70 at the low end to 98 at the high end. A 98 uh, CRI LED is going to reproduce colors very accurately. And if you're using LED to light, say, in the studio, and you're photographing human skin, you would want to use expensive high CRI LEDs. But when the primary goal is to get you started and get you going in macro photography, like we are doing in this series of videos, I'm not too bothered by the fact that the colors may not be uh, completely true to life. There are not many people who can look at a photograph of a housefly and say, hey, those mouth parts look awfully red. Um, it's, it's a less important thing, unless you're an entomologist or writing a textbook, which I take it most of you aren't. So I don't have any problem using low CRI lights because the barrier to entry financially is so low. Anybody who really gets into macro and decides that continuous lighting is their favorite way to go will end up buying a bunch of loom cubes and other expensive um, compact LED lights, which can cost you 80, 100, even more dollars a piece. So that's why we're using them. Thanks for the comment, Patrick. It was right on point, uh, but we're going uh, to be going with the cheap stuff for now. A few basic things about using continuous lighting uh, for macro photography. The first thing is we are going to be trying to control all of the light. So I think the best way to do continuous lighting macro is in the dark. By that, I mean all of these studio lights that are on are going to be turned off. I've even turned off my, my work light for now because it was messing up the camera. But we need to shoot in a dark room. And once you get your specimen uh, organized, and ready to, to start adding lights, it's a good idea to go ahead and take a long exposure shot, something that will be longer than you're actually going to end up using, but it's a good way to find out if there's any ambient light getting into the image, just the same way that you'd do with flash, though a little bit less important. But when you're shooting with longer exposures, uh, it is a good idea to make sure that there isn't anything that's going to be contaminating your photograph. The uh, next point was, as we set up this lighting, I will emphasize again and again that we add one light at a time. We make one adjustment at a time. We add one diffuser at a time. As soon as you start making <clears throat> multiple changes, you're not going to know what impact <clears throat> each of the changes had. 
And that's really confusing, and you don't learn much from doing that. It takes longer to, to do one light at a time, but, but when you do, you get a much better feel for, for what you're adding. Which leads into the second point that I think is equally important, is when you get a particular specimen set up just the way you want it, and your images are great, your lighting's perfect, Take a few photographs of your lighting cage, or I use a, I have a book and I'll make a diagram. On my other lighting cages, I had actually marked off uh, five centimeter increments on all of the arms so that I could note what I had where, uh, so that if I came back and I wanted that same light effect, I'd just look in the book, I'd see where all my lights were and I'd attach them right away. Don't forget, the inverse square law. We normally talk about that when we're using flash, but it is just as important, if not more important, when we're using continuous lighting. Without getting into the mathematics, even though it's really quite interesting, the inverse square law says that there's an inverse square relationship between the position of the light and the intensity of the light on your subject. Meaning, that if your subject is here and your light is here, if you move the light back twice as far, the light intensity falling on your, on your subject will be one quarter as intense as it was at this position. And similarly, if you move it half the way towards the subject, the light intensity is going to increase by a factor of four. So you'll be four times brighter if you move it half the distance closer. It's important to remember because you, you don't want to make big changes in light position unless you're looking for big changes in light intensity. So to sum up, take one picture to look for any ambient light sources. Number two, change or add or subtract one light, one modifier, one filter at a time. Three, draw a diagram of your setup so you can get straight back to it. And number four, bear in mind the inverse square law when you're fiddling around with multiple lights. So before we start taking pictures, let me introduce you to our subject for today. Everybody, this is Igor. Igor, this is everybody. Why am I using a plastic skull instead of some attractive insect for this uh, tutorial? Well, the reason is, is pretty simple. When you're, when you're photographing uh, an insect like this one, which was done with very, very basic setup and cheap LEDs, it becomes much harder to actually see the impact that your changes are having, basically because all of the colors and the fine details are distracting. So I picked this guy because he has a fairly smooth, uniform, roundish head that will allow us to really get a good feel for what our light's doing as we add it from different angles. And he's also got some big, deep eye sockets, which will uh, allow us to, to work with the lights to try to, to get light into crevices. When you're doing that with a big colorful insect with a lot of uh, bristles and colors and big eyes, it's much harder to see the effect your lighting is having. Uh, it's a bit of a distraction. As you get familiar with the positioning of the lights and you start photographing real subjects, you'll, you'll understand what I'm, what I'm saying. It's easier to start with something like this. In fact, I'm a huge fan of a photographer and a teacher uh, named uh, Carl Taylor. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar. If you're not, you really, really should check out his site. He's a, he's a master, he really is. And he understands lighting better than anybody I know. And uh, he just put out a video uh, a week or so ago. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but he was doing much the same thing we're doing only with an egg. He was using an egg as his subject to show how different lighting positions and types had different effects on the surface of an egg, which was, 
which was a brilliant idea. I was already planning on using Igor, but uh, it was reassuring to see that Carl Taylor was photographing an egg. Check him out, seriously. You'll, uh, you'll be impressed. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do, I've positioned Igor uh, using my multi-arm thingamajig and a toothpick skewer so that his head is kind of floating in space. We can take the stick out in Photoshop later, but I wanted to be able to get underneath him as well to, to add light there if necessary. I put a plain uh, white uh, backdrop. This is a piece of foam board. Uh, I have them in all different colors and you can just cut out a piece uh, as big as you need, clip it onto the, to the uh, frame and you've got a, uh, a beautiful backdrop. If you'd rather have uh, an infinite blackness behind your subject, you could remove this. Okay, so the lights are all out, and we're gonna begin with just a single key light, if you will. This is uh, one of those inexpensive LEDs coming in from above. It's clipped onto to one of the, the top uh, horizontals. You can see it's casting a, uh, a very dark shadow down at the bottom. Let's see, we're nicely in focus. Okay, very underexposed, but it points up an important question. Uh, the shutter speed has to be fast enough to reduce any vibration. And as sturdy as this light table is, when you're, when you're using a bendy arm to support your, your specimen, you're going to get some vibration. When you're using continuous lighting, you really wanna to try to get your shutter speed up about um, 100 for, for this 85 millimeter macro lens. Um, 100 is kind of fast for the, for the small amount of light we've added so far, but uh, I would urge you to be pretty quick to add some ISO, and uh, you're certainly going to be pretty much noise-free up to uh, about 1,000, even on, even on this inexpensive camera, and you can really go higher than that. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, uh, this one you have to go into the menu to find, there we are. Let's say 800 for now and see what that looks like. Let's take another picture. Okay, now we can see that with w the one key light, we've got terrible shadows um, in the tops of the eyes, they're not getting any light. There's no light underneath the, the top teeth. About the only thing that's getting, uh, getting any decent illumination is his bald head and his cigarette. So one of the first things that I would want to do in a setting like this would be to add a second light from below and in front to get into his eye sockets and get up underneath his uh, front teeth. Now, I have another LED here. This is a, a different model, but it's one I really like. I'll show it to you later. It's got a built-in diffuser. And even though, again, the CRI of this is abysmally low, uh, it, does, it does give a nice lighting effect if I can find the button. So let's add that. It's quite bright. I think it has a second switch. Yeah, the one I like about this, it has uh, several LEDs in it and it can give you this, uh, this fairly uh, white uh, coloration, like a, about 5,000 Kelvin, but it also has a, a softer incandescent uh, light as well. It can be both bright and dimmer. So let's stick with a 5,000 K, uh, which is, pretty close to what our other LEDs are. And let's see what difference that makes. Not much. The reason is the light is now getting blocked uh, by his uh, cheekbones. Um, we still have shadow in the back and you'll, you'll run into this all the time with macro subjects 
because they're full of nooks and crannies, especially when you get up around the head and you're photographing mouth parts. Let's try moving this light back and increasing its um, forward angle just a little bit. See what that does. It's better, but uh, I still don't like the, uh, the look of the shadows. I think what we're probably going to need to do is add another light. Let's, let's try, instead of adding one more light from the same angle, let's bring in a, a second LED, and then I think I'm going to move the first one over to the other side. But let's see how this one does. Well, that's kind of creepy looking, but I like it. All right, now we can start going back down on our ISO um, because we've added quite a bit of luminance now. So let's go back into the menu. You could put this on auto ISO if, if you want. I just, I don't usually use auto anything. Well, let's see what it does. So we'll put it on auto ISO and then take another picture. Pretty decent. Now, of course, because we have both of our LEDs, one coming from straight dead ahead, but two coming from the right side, uh, this is when I would switch uh, one of these lights to the other side. The more you bend these uh, these bendy arms, the less well they hold their, their position because they're under some tension. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Much better. Now we're getting light all the way underneath his front teeth and starting to get some, uh, some much better detail. What I don't like is the big looming shadow. One thing we could certainly do is remove the, uh, the backdrop. Is his cigarette actually a light? I've been trying to get him to quit. I've told him it's just no good for him. So this to me is, is why this lighting cage is such a cool tool to use for macro photography because we can make such minuscule changes We could, for example, add a mirror to reflect some of this light back down on the top of his head. Let's take a test shot. Okay, I like that. So to attach that, we'd need to use one of our clamps. When I'm using uh, reflectors or mirrors, I'll, I'll position them where I like them, where they're working, where they're putting the light where I want it. And then I will try to figure out what kind of a support I'm gonna use. This is the go-to solution for anything that you can't figure out a way to attach, is two super clamps on either end of um, an articulated arm. And they make these, like I said, in, in like 12 inch segments, which will literally get to the very center of this cage, which is incredibly useful. So I would just, uh, I just attach my arm to the top here, loosen it up, position my reflector. How did I have it? I, I think, that, yeah, that was where it was uh, lighting the top of his head. And positioning it is just as easy as that. Clamp that in position, then tighten it up. 
if I was taking my time, I would move the this to the other side so as not to cast any shadows. So let me show you how I use gels in this type of setup. Uh, let's say I wanted I wanted to throw some red light up into the skull, then what I find is the easiest way to do it is to just take a, a small piece of acrylic. I have pieces cut much smaller than this. Uh, they're easy to cut. If you get an acrylic knife, you just score them and, and snap them. It's quite similar to glass, only easier. And uh, depending on the size that you want. And then I just take a piece of this uh, super inexpensive foil, uh, not foil, um, cellophane wrapping paper that you can get at dollar stores again. And I just cut a small piece out and I sticky tape it to the acrylic. And what we could do with this, I don't know if you remember my trick for making uh, things stand up, is using a, um, a standard clamp in one corner edge and it'll act as feet. One trick, by the way, that I didn't mention, if you're using these flat type clamps, it's always a good idea to clamp uh, at right angles to the direction of the torque. For example, if you clamp it in line, it will have a tendency to slip uh, around the, the uh, PVC. But if you clamp it at right angles, it, it won't slip. In fact, it'll, it'll hold more securely. Um, so think about that when you're positioning your lights, what's the best way to, uh, to make the attachment? Mm, I think that should do it. Let's see what that looks like. There you go. That's a little dull. Remember that gels, even, even a one single thin layer of gel is going to take away anywhere from one to two stops of light. And that's important. Just like remembering the inverse square law. So one of the other lights that we talked about using was one of these more powerful uh, multi-LED lamps. The problem with these lights is they are really bright. And I would pretty much always recommend that if you're going to be using these, these multi-LED lights, use a diffusion panel. Uh, these uh, I, I made with uh, little elastic attachments so that they can they can be attached to the light or to the the arms of the cage or you can just hold it in place and it makes quite a big difference to the quality of the light it really softens it nicely these are too glary to use without uh, some kind of a, a diffuser but they're great Great, great for adding color using a gel. Because you don't get uh, nearly as much uh, light loss. Well, you get as much light loss, but you're starting out with a much brighter light. Another thing that's worth bearing in mind is if you do want your background element to be part of the photograph, uh, you can do what uh, I've done here with one of the LEDs. We'll do it with this one. Would be to clamp your LED onto your one of your uprights. And did I just turn it off? No. And then then position it however you want it from underneath to cast light on your backdrop so that you're, you're seeing that to the extent that you want to. A better backdrop light would be the, the brighter, more powerful LED because we're dealing with quite a bit of distance there. So how close can, can we put these lights? Um, very, very close indeed. With the way that we've got this thing framed, you can have your, your lights yeah, easily that close, probably closer than that. 
you can't change the intensity of a fixed continuous light like you can with flash. So going back to what I said at the beginning, the way that you can control the intensity of your light is by the proximity of your light source to your subject. So if we thought this was nice, but it wasn't bright enough, we might decide to move our clamp closer and then position the light closer. Though that might not be working from below. Let me try it from, um, let me try putting the light here. Yeah, already you can see that in order to to position the light closer, and you can get these things really, really close and then uh, not be in your, in your field of view. Clearly, we're going to need a second light on the other side, and that's fine. I, I love multiple lights because they give a real three-dimensionality to the, to the image. The best way to do this, by the way, and I, I'm not doing it this way because I, I want to show you what's going on. You wouldn't be able to see if I was, but would be to have the cage turned around and I would be sitting at the end and I would be monitoring all of these light movements through the lens of the camera. That's the only way to do it. So in real time, unlike with flash, where you have to take a test shot, look at it, decide what you're going to change and then change it. The beauty of uh, continuous lighting is if your eye is up to the viewfinder, you can make these movements in real time. I didn't show you this secret weapon uh, in the last video, uh, but this thing is, is really awesome for, for macro with continuous lighting. This is a mirror on a bendy arm that uh, is made for, um, I think it's made for automobile mechanics to be able to inspect the underside of things. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure that I'd be any good at doing that, but this is wonderful for bouncing a little or a lot of light into hard to reach places. In this case, uh, let's say I didn't have another light that I could bring in from the other side. I could position this just using a regular old clamp. Actually, the easiest way to do it is like that. I don't know if you can see that where you are, but I'm just putting it through a regular clamp and clamping it to one of the cross beams. And then you can literally position this wherever you want it. Now, in this case, I wanted it to be a, a little bit to the front and bounce a little bit more light back into that side of the skull. Tremendous. Now that is not adding a light. It's picking up, picking up some of the light from this LED and bouncing it back up underneath the right side of the face. And that really works. Fantastic. If you haven't figured this out yet, you will. Uh, this is very much a matter of personal taste. Um, once, you, once you understand what you're trying to do, where you're trying to put the light, it really becomes a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, process. In other words, there's, there's no way that uh, I can tell you that you're going to light an insect perfectly every time with one light at this angle and one light at that angle and a mirror. Uh, obviously, that is, is going to be no more true in macro photography than it is in any other kind of photography. You, you, you choose your lighting for the effect that you're trying to have. But what I want to get across to you is that you have almost infinite flexibility when you're doing it this way. It's, it's why the trade-offs of having to shoot at a, a lower shutter speed or add a, a bit of ISO is, is well worth it when you can see just how fine of, of an adjustment you can make to the light. Um, just like you would with uh, a human subject, if you wanted 
to, to get a, uh, an exciting rim of light from behind, you could add a hair light, or in this case, I guess a bone light, which will, will work much the same way it does with hair. I really like that. Mm -hmm. what, what that light is doing coming in from underneath, it's actually giving a, uh, a halo effect around the lower part of the, the skull. And you're seeing the, the, the heads of his mandibles lighting up underneath there. It's a, it's a really cool creative effect. And I use backlighting a lot in, in uh, uh, shooting insects. It's a great way to really emphasize the details in the legs and the wings. Uh, so that, that's, that's another trick. Uh, I've talked about backlighting the, um, I mean, lighting the background. You could, if you wish, shine a light on the background. Um, I, it's, not, it's, it's not one of the, the ways I, I, I like to go. If I, if I want a lit background, I will usually add a, a closer end background and light it independently from the back uh, cross beam. Flashlights. I mentioned them. I use these uh, quite a lot and I've got all different kinds. They're all cheap. They're all low CRI LEDs. Uh, but again, they are wonderful for positioning and you can get them really close in, but you can make a snoot out of tin foil that has a pinhole at the end. I'll tell you what, let me go get some tin foil and we'll do it. This is a poor man's version of the, the nano lights that uh, my, uh, my hero Carl Taylor uses when he's doing product photography. He has these studio lights that create a tiny focused beam of, of light and he'll use it to bring out a highlight and a piece of jewelry or something. They're just amazing. So this is never going to give the kind of kind of results that Carl Taylor's uh, uh, nano lights will, but in a pinch, it'll get by. Take the shiny side of your paper. Make sure that's on the inside. You're going to need something to roll the the end of the snoot around so that it maintains its shape. What I do is I just take the I take the tin foil with the shiny part facing in, wrap it around the light like so. I hope you can see that. Doesn't have to be precise. And if you wish, so you don't lose too much light because of distance, you can snip the end off. I hear that's not very good for scissors, like so. Now I'll take a, a little piece of tape. I'll use the tape I just had. Waste not, want not, as my mother used to say, before throwing some food or other away. All right, we'll, we'll wrap that around there just, just to hold it in place. This really is not rocket science. And then what I'll do is I'll take my guide and I'll put it right in the center of the light like so and just gently form the tin foil right around. That's not straight. I normally take a little bit more time than this, but when it's nice and tightly on there, you pull it out and Bob's your uncle. So I could say that's all there is to continuous lighting, but that's quite a lot. And uh, if you're not familiar with lighting bigger subjects, if you haven't been, uh, been doing photography for very long, then you really need to pay attention to this concept of adding or adjusting one light at a time and building up the effect with light. It's really, really important in continuous lighting that you, uh, that you take it in, a, in, in steps 
and that you check with photographs when you make changes and you know what effects those changes are having, both intended and unintended consequences of adding a light or moving a light or adding a, a filter or a, a, a diffuser. So if you're new to this stuff, you've got some practice that you can be doing now. And believe me, you can, you can make some really remarkable photographs with just a couple of lights, or for that matter, a light and a mirror. Uh, you don't have to, uh, to, to fill your house with uh, LED lights to, to make this work for you. The key elements uh, are add or adjust one light at a time. Uh, remember the inverse square law, the distance makes a huge difference when you're using uh, continuous light. Don't be afraid to raise your ISO a little bit if it allows you to get to a better shutter speed. Uh, the biggest enemy in continuous lighting for me is motion artifact. And the uh, slower your shutter speed, the bigger of a problem that becomes. When you're buying your LEDs, if the information is available, try to match your color temperatures as closely as possible. You don't wanna to have uh, too many uh, uh, variations in color temperature in your lights. It can make things look a bit odd. Most important thing is practice, practice, practice. As always, thank you for watching the video. Thank you for everybody who's supporting what I'm doing here. I really appreciate it. I've got so much cool stuff coming up this spring. I hope, uh, I hope we have time to get to it all. Uh, see you in a few days when we're going to do macro cage lighting with flash. And until then, farewell.